I, like so many alumni, found some of my life's most special treasures at Concordia. Two of my dearest friends, Beth Barton Amos, class of 70, and Ruth Kramer, class of 75, were my classmates. And even though we now live a distance from each other, we remain close confidants, supporting each other when life presents hurdles and sharing the joys of happy times. There is a saying, friends are the relatives you choose. I am blessed they chose me. And again, like so many others, I met my lifelong partner and love, Professor Gerald Furman at Concordia. Little did I know when I was a young Lutheran girl growing up in Queens and attending Reformation rallies, dedications of new buildings, basketball tournaments, etc., at Concordia, that I would be linked to the school for most of my life. I graduated from junior college in 1971 and returned in 1973 after marrying that year to be in the first four-year graduation class of 1975. I often kidded Gerald that instead of agreeing to a prenup, he was the lucky financer of my second two years of college tuition. We were married for 45 of the 52 years Gerald taught at Concordia, which I recently realized is more than one third of the school's existence. So there have been numerous events, services, homecomings, etc., that draw me back to campus. Both of us have a great amount of personal history with Concordia. So it was with the very deep sadness that we learned that the school was closing. It is almost like a passing of a loved one. And it is very challenging to accept the situation. But Gerald and I have many good and interesting memories and those will remain with us for the rest of our lives, which is truly a blessing. The highlight of my academic experience at Concordia, without a doubt, the trip to England and Scotland with Professor Dr. Alan Steinberg during the interim of 1975. He made history come alive, and it was a once in a lifetime experience, which I will always treasure. Concordia College, New York, from 1961 to 1963. During my freshman year, I was a resident in Ward House, where the Dean of Women, Esther Hendricks, was the residence counselor. Both years, I was involved in the Women's Dorm Council, in a leadership position under the supervision of Dean Hendricks during my sophomore year. Before I graduated, Dean Hendricks told me she would like me to replace her when she retired. Her encouragement changed my educational path, leading me to earn an MA in Student Personnel Administration in Higher Education. In 1966, I was extended a divine call to do student personnel work at Concordia, which eventually was expanded to include teaching. I assumed Dean Hendricks' responsibilities prior to her retirement and also met my future husband, Will Whitfield, who taught German there. I worked at Concordia for three years before getting married and moving to Illinois in 1969. God worked through Concordia and the supportive administration and faculty to greatly impact the course of my life. Concordia holds a special place in Will and my heart.
My first impression of Concordia was in 1967, and it goes like this. Here we are Concordia. We're going to teach you how to make a living, and as important, we're going to teach you how to make a life. That description resonated with me, and it still does. I don't remember who said it. My Concordia experience did teach me how to make a life, a good life that I know will include eternal life. I still smile with pride when I think of my calculus teacher, Mr. Leinick, calling me star. If he called other students star, I don't want to know. It made me feel capable and recognized and valued and smart. Girl smart. When I think of Concordia College, New York, my first thought is about the lifelong friends that I made. I am thankful that Guinea and John organized the 50th reunion celebration. My closest friends, Connie, Deirdre, Irene, and Judith were all at the reunion. It was the first time that all of us were together since our junior year at Concordia, Chicago. We have shared the accomplishments of family members through Christmas letters throughout the years. We were the first graduating class to live in Ramoser. Dr. and Mrs. Dore were responsible for the residents. During freshman year, Connie, Dee, Irene, and I lived in Kepchen. Judy lived in Morehouse. I have remained connected to my big sister at Kepchen Mary. My roommate my freshman year was Diane. Daily evening devotions for the house or on your floor were part of the experience of being at Concordia. It seems to me that 90% of the class of 1964 continued their education at Concordia Fort Wayne, Concordia River Forest, or Concordia Seward. Almost everyone attended chapel as part of their college schedule. I do not remember anyone questioning Daily Chapel. Over the four semesters, we studied the Old Testament, the New Testament, and two semesters of Lutheran doctrine. The goal for most of the students was to be Lutheran pastors or teachers in Lutheran schools. The school culture reflected the values of the early 1960s. I remember attending a square dance, only square dancing was allowed on campus. Women wore skirts to class. Men wore button down shirts. There were very narrow guidelines about men and women's dormitory. I have enjoyed many Sunday afternoon music concerts at Concordia. I brought my grandchildren to Saturday children's theater events. I remember attending the 25th reunion. Concordia, New York has been an integral part of my life since 1962. May God bless all of the alumni whose formation as Lutheran teachers and ministers began at Concordia, New York. May the Holy Spirit use their ministry to strengthen the faith of their students and congregants. May the faith of all alumni be strengthened so that on the last day they may rejoice with our Savior.
During our junior college years, a few of us thought that maybe Clippers was an old, tire, uninspiring identification for our teams in need of a replacement. We considered a few names and thought maybe Yellow Jackets or another animal would make a good mascot and name. So we approached Coach Clyde Kaminska with our great ideas. Coach, who gave me my nickname Pex from the Boy Scout Camp, Camp Winnipeg on Long Island, not only disagreed, but as I remember, was quite upset that we would even consider this change. So Clippers remained, and years later, I'm very happy it did. I think it was the spring of 1962. Renovations were to be made in Bum Hall, and so the prep students needed to move to Seeker Hall. Given this laborious task, we, of course, found ways to have fun. While we transferred personal items carefully, we were not about to carry mattresses down from the third floor of Bone for Me across and back up to a room in Seeker. So we decided that open windows and gravity would have to serve our purposes. Many mattresses were seen floating or flying and dropping through the air for a time. I guess they all survived and we got ourselves moved. I don't remember any punishment from the administration. My dorm life was third floor living. Yes, many steps to climb, but no noise or problems overhead. Dorm life involved many things, but for a while, a group of third floor seeker residents were known as the Spastics. Not proud of that today. We carried that moniker around campus and at group events. If those on the lower floors needed correction, or maybe just for fun, we found that water poured on our floors somehow went down and wetted those below. Maybe more time should have been spent at Spurgat's library. Phillips, and I live in Annapolis, Maryland. When my picture appeared in the 1956 Concordia Collegiate Institute yearbook, it was under the name Dolores Sulger. I went by D to all. CCI was my only on-campus college life, and I was lucky to attend. No one in my family had done so. <coughs> A small scholarship helped me out financially, and I worked in the Concordia Library to repay some of the funding. My dorm life started out in the beautiful Colonial Ward House. I was designated a dorm single, but my room had a fireplace. Awesome. The next year, I moved across the street, White Plains Road, to another woman's dorm, Kepchen House and into a triple with two great dorm mates. Concordia was a Lutheran, faith-based educational college, so I will mention some favorite courses. Humanities with Professor E. Lukey was a phenomenal course of culture, art, religion, and more. Dr. Heinrich Meyer, who should have been enjoying retirement, worked hard at teaching us some basic German. My favorites, however, were the science courses. Bio, botany, and who could forget the search for the unknown in microbiology? All were taught by a great Dean Hosman. I think of micro every time I stand in a lengthy food store line in midsummer and think of the rising bacteria count in my food. Extracurricular time for me focused on one thing an alto part in the chapel, church, and touring choirs. Mr. Mott, our choir director, got us in the touring bus on time, and we toured sites near and far from Bronxville. 
we sang to appreciative church audiences and receptive hosts. For these few and many more memories, Concordia will always have a warm place in my memory. I truly regret that I will not continue in the same way for others. The librarian while I was in Concordia Prep School was a pompous prick. He was less popular on campus than having root canal without Novocaine. As librarian of a small male prep school in the 60s, everyone despised him. On Tuesday, he taught classes until 3 p.m. Otherwise, he was in the school library all day. When he finished class, he would inspect his beloved library. You would think it was the New York City Public Library, whereas it was just one large room lined with bookcases. He posted his rules in the library entrance and relished punishing the those who committed infractions. One day, a student had the audacity to start for his lunch break 15 seconds before the bell sounded. He pounced. Pointing to the rule number seven, the librarian chastised the perpetrator for his transgression. The penalty for this senior classman, a 15-minute timeout and late for lunch. Earlier in the year at orientation, our infamous librarian addressed the students with these immortal words. One day, I would like to come into the library and see every book checked out and every shelf bare. Sitting quietly for 15 minutes, our discipline senior classman remembered his earlier words, and so the chapter began. Eliciting the help of nearly every student, the following Tuesday, the run on the library commenced. It started with students checking out individual books. Seeing that this was not enough to fulfill our librarian's circulation dream, each student grabbed an armful of books and transported them back to his dormitory room. Ancient Egyptian history was now lodged in room 308, English literature in 201, and so on. Entering the library that Tuesday afternoon and seeing the shelves completely bare, the librarian nearly had a stroke. The following day, an emergency school assembly was called to address what occurred. Standing before the student body, the red-faced librarian spoke, Young men, you cannot begin to imagine the time and the effort to restock all those books in their correct places in order. Looking out at everyone and expecting to see remorseful faces, he rather saw the students trying hard to contain their pleasure. from the 1950s when women's dorms were three buildings off campus and the women's curriculum included nursing, teaching, or secretarial science. Happily, many years later, my credits were accepted by Suffolk County Community College, Long Island, towards a degree in physical therapy assistant. Concordia earned an excellent reputation through the years and remains a fine institution. I had a lifetime of friendship from my roommates who passed. I sorely miss Elaine Schacht and Mary Ann Brandt. We celebrated together at our last big reunion in Bronxville. Nice memories. Thank you for a chance to share my favorite memories of a very special place, Concordia, Bronxville. 53 years ago, my parents took an eager 17-year-old to Kepkin Hall where I met my lovely roomie with the beautiful long red hair. And we became besties and said so long to our melancholy mothers. One favorite memory? Uh-uh, my head is full, my heart is full. A campus with character in a beautiful picturesque location. But my favorite memories are the faith building learning experiences and interactions with music faculty like my first music theory classes with the soft-spoken Professor Oftenberg, who reminded me so much of my own dad, the classroom in the basement of what is now, what then became the student union, where the mail room was, and the old chapel, it was the old gym. 
My audition for choir is vivid. That was the real prize I came for. Doc Schultz at the piano in the practice room playing Beautiful Savior, though not my favorite hymn because it was so high, in a key that I could comfortably sing, hopefully with my best tone because I was at alto and not I didn't want to sound like an alto attempting to be a soprano, followed by some sight reading. That practice room holds my very best memories since choir met five times a week for at least an hour and a half or two hours, Monday through Friday, I believe, right before dinner, because who in the world could sing on a full stomach? The practice room, the practices with uh, Professor Aftenberg on piano and Doc often telling us the stories of faith about composers like Paul Manns when his son was critically ill and composing the song after a prayer, E'en So Lord Jesus. His son recovered. He attributes to prayer, the prayer that then led to that song. Or how Bach wove the shape of the cross into a cantata that we were learning. Second year, I vividly remember piano lessons with Tom Schmidt. Oh boy, I'm so sorry that I didn't practice enough to take full advantage of his expertise. His willingness to let me learn a contemporary piece of music, classical gas, in the hopes that I'd practice more and make it performance ready. But shame on me, I did not. His patience. Thank you for that. Also, second year was a fantastic music theory class with the doc himself and earning an A on a final composition, homework that I love doing, creating melodies. The location was, though, was special, was incidental to the faith building music. The biggest lessons reiterated time and again, especially from Ralph Schultz in the choir practice was the singing of the faith saving gospel that gospel message singing the word built our faith with the aim of sharing that gospel message with whoever listened that was the instruction from concordia new york that i will never forget i'm confident and i know it will never end because i'm confident the Holy Spirit is in charge of that. Even when it looks like we've failed or lost opportunities, missed opportunities, his psalms and songs of praise continue as my mother and father taught me and as Concordia reinforced, we will go on and others will go on singing, praise the Lord.
It will have been 55 years since my graduation from Concordia Junior College in Bronxville, New York. The two years there are a precious memory to me and to so many others. It was my privilege and pleasure to sing in the Concordia Tour Choir. At the time of this story, I was a freshman alto from Ohio in New York in a choir taping a television broadcast for NBC with the esteemed Lutheran Hour speaker, Dr. Oswald Hoffman. The choir, professor at the time, Ralph Schultz, Professor Oftenberg, Dr. Hoffman, and the team taping the program worked hard all day and into the evening at Village Lutheran Church. The choir needed to move through the chancel to change formations a few times and dressed in our robes and dress shoes as for a concert, it seemed we couldn't tread softly enough in our dress shoes. We were sent home and we returned in our sneakers. That worked. It was well past dinner when we finished, but we were rewarded with a steak dinner in the dining hall. This was before the days of streaming, YouTube, or even VCRs, so I never did get to see the program even though it aired in my hometown and my parents saw it. But we had shared the story of Jesus' birth with many people. Singing in the choir, I had the sense that we were working hard to reach the best of our abilities, and in doing so, we were praising God in song and sharing with others God's wonderful gifts through our singing. in Concordia, Bronxville, in the fall of 1967. I had felt called to go into ministry uh, from an uh, event in the balcony of my church back in Albany. So I went off to junior college, uh, hoping to be prepared to be a minister in the church one day. I remember the first Greek class I had with Pastor Carl Weidman. He read to us the uh, gospel from John chapter 21, where Jesus and Peter are on the seaside. And Jesus asks Peter if he loves him more than these, uh, for supposedly the uh, other disciples. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. This goes on a second time. The third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter was sad. And he said, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. 
Pastor Weidman then proceeded to ask us what that meant. What was going on? There was a student who said that uh, it was probably a reminder to Peter that he had denied Jesus and therefore his love was suspect. We tried the best we could, but we were not familiar with the Greek. Pastor Weidman then opened up his Greek Bible and read it and explained it. It began with a question from Jesus, Peter, do you love me, agapao, sacrificially, unconditionally, the way I have just loved you and gone to the cross for you? Peter responded by saying, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you like a brother, thinking it was the same thing. Second time, Jesus asked, do you agapao me? sacrificially, unconditionally. And Peter responded, Yes, Lord, you know I follow you. Again, thinking Jesus needed uh, that reminder, but it was the same. The third time, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you follow me? Is all you can do is love me like a brother? The way you want me to love you is the way you love me? And Peter was sad, and he said, Yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I just love you like a brother. Of course, that is the distinctive difference in the Christian church and the disciple of Christ, is that our love toward another person, friend, stranger, or enemy, doesn't depend on their actions toward us, but Christ's action. Romans 5. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies with God, while we were weak, that's God's love for us in sending Christ, especially as we remember Holy Week and the Easter celebration. It is Christ who has gone to the cross for us. With that introduction to Greek, I studied like mad. And to this day, 45, six, seven years later, I still use the Greek to understand that word of God and make sure that what I'm proclaiming is what Christ proclaimed. I'll ever be thankful for Pastor Weidman's commitment, even as we met at times in his bedroom, surrounding his bed as he was too sick to get up, but never canceled a class that I could remember. I was very thankful to be able to see him in his last uh, months of life in the nursing home. and I was thankful for his teaching and his dedication to the Word. either in December of 1947 or January of 1948 that this 8th grade graduate went into the office of Professor Henry Prohl and sought admission to CCI. He wanted to become a pastor. He hoped he could be enrolled in Cordia's freshman classes in February. No, you cannot be enrolled was the word of Professor Prohl. This 8th grader left in tears. In 1947, some New York City public schools ended the school year in January, others in June. My years at PS79 in the Bronx ended in January 1948. In February 1948, I would be a ninth grade freshman. I would hope at Concordia, but Professor Prohl told me I could not be a freshman at CCI. Therefore, the tears. I had to wait six months till September. Years later, I was tempted to tell my brother, Adamore, and his family, who then wanted to join the church I was serving as pastor, that they would have to wait six months till we receive them. No, 
the Prohl family was joyfully, immediately received as members, and they were a blessing to us. But the first tears of denied admission were replaced with countless memories of joy in the six years that followed. Six of us there began the year 1948 with a desire to enter the holy ministry, graduated 11 years later from the St. Louis Seminary. They are all joyfully remembered with gratitude. There are countless memories that could be included in this text, but I only add this memory, which itself is a challenge to remember. The six years in Cordia have left six year books, one edited by Norman Dietz in 1950, and the limited experience of this graduate of 1954 ought to be in any yearbook hall of fame. It begins with the words, No, they say, you cannot recapture the joy of the past, but I dared to come back. Editor Dinky Dietz then relates his going back with the most memorable words. He writes of a pelting summer rain that was creating rings and bubbles. I had come to faculty row with the hope in my heart that I might see a familiar face, clasp a familiar hand, but the houses turned out to be equally dark, empty, and unfriendly. A chattering squirrel and noisy joy were my only host. Then, leaning against a tree, I tried for a moment to forget the rain, the wind, the emptiness. I think I almost chuckled to myself when I remembered the Oshkosh mathematician. The Oshkosh mathematician was Elmer Doberstein, to whom the yearbook was dedicated that year. He is the source of many wonderful memories, not only of his living the faith of our confession of the crucified and risen Christ, but of his academic wisdom in the classroom where he taught us algebra and geometry, and also of memories on the basketball court where he, ins where he insisted that every free throw be an underhanded free throw. This final word in this text about editor Dietz in his 1950 yearbook. There is a picture of the Concordia staff in the yearbook. Those of us who remember will know which of the seven in the picture is Norman Dietz, but the accompanying words do not mention his name as editor. What the accompanying words do say are these words about the 1950 yearbook. In spite of itself, I gave mine to the Salvation Army. Good reading for the blind. No, Norman, wonderful reading for those who want to relive their days at CCI. The night the lights went out. While I have many memories of my two years at CCI, Concordia Collegiate Institute, one night stands out. On November 9, 1965, a massive power outage turned the East Coast dark, including Bronxville. An unobstructed full moon provided the only light for many neighbors. The outage really seemed to upset our house mother at Overbeck, and we students kept her company by candlelight in our dorm room for quite a while. There were all kinds of rumors about what had happened, from the Russians had invaded to the Martians had landed. My roommate, John Fritz, had gone to New York City to do research search at the New York City Public Library. When he had not returned that next morning after the power was restored, I became concerned and reported him missing to the Dean of Students. When John finally showed up later that day, we asked him where he had been during the blackout. When the power went out in the library and everywhere else, he walked all the way uptown through Harlem to the Washington Bridge where he was able to catch a bus to a relative's house in New Jersey. When the power resumed, John returned to the library to complete his research before returning to Bronxville. Of course, he never bothered to call us about his whereabouts, which caused us great concern. When we challenged him about all that, all he said was, no news is good news. It was a night to remember. It's been six decades since I was enrolled in the Concordia Collegiate Institute in Bronxville. I had kept in touch with two of my roommates for much of that time, Dave Just and Bob Miles. Dave and I both went on to Valparaiso University and shared a dorm room during our junior years. Dave went on to law school at Fordham and to a career as a patent attorney, but he died just a couple years prior to our CCI Golden Anniversary celebration in 2012. Bob and I reconnected at that reunion and discovered that we were both spending the winter months of our retirement years near Venice, Florida. Together with our wives, we went on walks and bike rides through recreation areas, watched tennis, theater, and music exhibitions, and reminisced about who and what we remembered from Concordia those many years ago. In his later years, Bob suffered from a chronic lung disease from which he succumbed in the spring of 2019. 
I matriculated in the Concordia Collegiate Institute in Bronxville in the fall of 1960. I was a recent graduate of Livingston, New Jersey High School and was accepting $600 scholarship offered in part for my participation in the varsity soccer team. This would be my first extended residence away from my family home, so the heady feeling of freedom and independence were offset by the challenges to develop self-discipline and meet the targets set by my professors for study, preparation for tests, and production of papers. I also had to keep my room neat, do my own laundry, and overcome hunger until the next time the dining hall was open. Looking back, I'm glad I faced these challenges at a small school where I had direct access to my professors, where friendships with classmates were easy to forge, and where the lectures were only a few hundred yards away from the furthest part of the dormitory so I could sprint to class and arrive on time even when my alarm clock failed to wake me up. I have fond memories of the faculty, and especially Professor Rock Hill Rocky, Reverend Clyde Kaminsky, Frau Wolf, and Professor Wilbur Leakey. Rocky was our chemistry professor and had a great way to explain chemical reactions, valences, and the periodic table. He also served as the head counselor in Seeker Hall, and he managed the co-op store, or the coop, in the basement where sweets, treats, and sundries could be purchased between 7 and 8 p.m. most evenings. Frau Wolf was our German language professor. She taught us the nuances of subject and verb structure and introduced the writings of Thomas Mann, Friedrich von Schiller, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and Eric Marie Remarque, all quiet on the Western Front, and encouraged us also to learn German culture through the music of Brahms, Beethoven, Bach, and Mozart. Clyde Kaminsky was the head of the athletics department and a great cheerleader for our intergalactic league teams. And Wilbur Leakey taught history, government, and the social sciences all in a manner which inspired interest, involvement, and passion to keep learning. years were very meaningful and rewarding to me. My acceptance for admission to the 1967 freshman class as a teacher education student was a thrill to start my professional tenure of teaching elementary students in both the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate's Lutheran education system and the New York State public education system. Life on the Concordia Bronxville New York campus served to pave the way towards continual Christian growth and lasting relationships, which contributed to my journey through life. I came from a small city in central New York called Rome. I arrived on campus with many apprehensions, fear, and expectations, not unlike most freshmen arriving that day. Meeting my roommate, setting up housekeeping in my little corner of the Ramoser Sigma dorm room, and bidding farewell to my parents became one more step to becoming a college student. Registering for classes, meeting Sigma residents, enduring crazy orientation antics by the sophomores, and adjusting to new schedules dominated the first two weeks at Concordia. Soon, class commenced, and I began to question what I had gotten myself into. Looking back at it all now, I realized that my being there was definitely directed by God's bidding. It indeed was the place he wanted me. I survived the challenges and the rigors of academics and grew in knowledge and faith because of them. Concordia, New York, was known as Concordia Collegiate Institute in 1967 to 1969 and was a two-year junior college. It was there that I first learned that there was an upstate and a downstate New York. Flashback memories in my mind picture events from both of those years I was there. One such picture during orientation shows me, as a sophomore, in the dining hall one morning watching several freshman guys carrying a sheeted bed mattress and maneuvering it through the door. Atop the mattress was a sophomore who had demanded breakfast in bed. The freshman delivered his command. 
This was a very clever antic, which drew laughter and applause. I wish I had a camera with me to capture that moment. Another memory is that of class with Dean Gabbert. He would faithfully take attendance by calling names before each class. When he would come to my simple name of Fike, he would always mispronounce the name as Fiki. My response to him was, it's Fike, like bike. After a while, we would hear giggles and comments coming from classmates every time attendance was called. At graduation, bets were being taken as to how Dean Gabbert would pronounce my name. It was decided that if he said Fiki, all would stand and shout, Fike! Alas, the dean had redeemed himself and pronounced my name correctly at graduation, so there were no sounds of Fike being made that day. Walks to the ice cream shop bowling alley, and around the village of Bronxville were common occurrences. Visiting classmates, cheering at basketball tournaments, studying at the library, and practicing piano and organ in the music hall flashback as well. The most reoccurring flashbacks of my memories are those at the wonderful times I spent with the Concordia Tour Choir the reason I chose to come to Concordia, Bronxville, New York. Strict bedtimes the night before a concert were kept in check by bed checkers in each dorm. Risers, robe, coffin, baggers, harpsichord, harp, sound equipment, PR, devotion, and cleaning crews sprang into action every time we boarded or disembarked the bus. Quiet hours were faithfully observed on and off the bus. Practice sessions, meal times, spaghetti anyone? Devotions and warm-ups preceded each concert. Pre-concert and intermission prep talks and announcements provided necessary focus on the gospel message to be delivered. And we mustn't forget the distribution of slippery alms to soothe the throat. Our nurse, Mrs. Offenberg, kept a quiet and loving vigilance over everyone and provided comfort to anyone suffering from mild ailments. Our last concert evening entertainment provided by the sophomore class included awards to all the best of the tour and the sharing of any tidbits of recorded phrases uttered by our fearless leaders, Dr. Schultz and Professor Offenberg. At one such night entertainment evening, a male barbershop quartet planned to surprise Doc by entertaining with one member of the four wearing Doc's favorite vests. The vest was provided by Mrs. Schultz before the tour with instructions to take care of it. When it was time to perform, the quartet found that the vest was missing. You can imagine how distraught they were. They looked everywhere for it, but no avail. The vest was gone. They would have to tell Mrs. Schultz that they lost Doc's favorite vests. After the quartet sang, they were interrupted by a surprise appearance of an all-female quartet. I was one of them, which proceeded to sing. One of the gals was wearing, you guessed it, the lost vest. I will not reveal how we got the vest, but the prank was successfully pulled. Pairing off by twos, the choir partners would ride off with their hosts for refreshment and rest with strict orders to arrive back on the bus on time to sign in or be left behind. Host would lavish us with remarkable breakfast choices and rush us out to the door to get to church on time. Singing at the concerts each night was absolutely rewarding. We began each concert with a mighty fortress and ended with none room. Heatedly singing the words during rehearsals and concerts provided memories which have lasted to this day. Recordings from the concerts also kept the blessings of such memories alive in our hearts. The Holy Spirit worked in us and through us throughout the tour and long after. Singing at Carnegie Hall served as a fine ending to our tour. Experiencing all these events is the reason we treasure 
and love our Concordia days with the choir, a privilege which, unfortunately, others will no longer have. After graduation, I went on to finish my teaching degree at Concordia College River Forest. My time there was also rewarding, as were my teaching days at Redeemer Lutheran Day School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Returning to my hometown of Rome, New York, I married my husband, Glenn. We raised our three sons. Our eldest, Ben, sang in the choir and graduated from Concordia, New York. He is now a pastor at Grace Lutheran in Niagara Falls, New York, and also treasures his time spent at our beloved Concordia. Our fellowship with Dr. and Mrs. Schultz continues as we sing with the Jubilee Choir under Doc's direction at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Del Mar, New York. To my fellow 1967 to 1969 classmates, faculty, and board, I am truly thankful for every remembrance of you. Our church is suffering a great loss with the closing of this great institution. Our 50 year gathering in 2009 brought us together, perhaps for the very last time until we meet again in our heavenly home. May we give glory and praise to God on high and to Christ our savior as we may utter together these words. Hail to thee, Concord.